So welcome to this recording of the um, of the latest lecture, the second lecture in the A Star series. So yep, today what we are going to um, go through, we are going to go um, through technique in terms of answering questions in the reading part of the A Star exam. So we're not going to look at um, actual exam questions today but we're going to go through in future weeks where we're going to look at each question individually but today we are going to have a look at the sort of technique the sort of way you use quotations in the exams how you extract information and how um, you expand across and view each of um, HF. I'm just going to share in the um, chat the document but we are going to um, use tonight. So I'm also going to share it on my screen as I go, but if you find it easy, you can follow along in the document. Um, equally, that document is there for you to, to use after the class as well um, for you for you to keep. I mean, also what I'm going to share in the chat, I'm just going to share um, the links to our um, YouTube's um, playlist for this course. So it's going to be two links the first one's to this lecture so this lecture um is being recorded and will get added um to that feed also has the lecture from last week the second link has the entire series so if you want to go ahead at all or if you want to watch sort of a different version of the same lecture because although it will be the same topic from one series to the next there might be slight differentiations there may be questions people have asked which give additional information anything like that where there's a full um playlist there as well and yeah as i said if you've got any questions at any point please don't hesitate to ask you can either write them in the messages or um which i'll check intermittently or you can put on your microphone at um any point as well given that it's not a busy um class tonight either way is absolutely fine okay so what we've called this lecture, we call it um, point evidence explanation and using quotations in answer. So point evidence explanation is really a bit of um, a simplification, a way of remembering the general idea of what you do in this exam. And there's slight variations on this theme as you go through each individual question. But this gives you a good idea of sort of a structure you can use again and again in the reading part of the exams of questions one to five and it's the idea that well every single time you make a point you need to back it up with evidence evidence in the form of quotation every single time you do this as well you need to explain you need to explain um, what your evidence shows what your point is and you need to expand across that as well so in terms of the three letters we've got the p for the point which is generally what you are trying to say the EV evidence, which is the quotation to back up your point. Now, every single time you make a point, as I say in the reading part of the exam, you need to back up with evidence. But the evidence, it can be short. You don't need to give long quotations. You want to keep your quotes as short as possible in order to make the point. To only quote what you need and nothing more, but that evidence needs to be there. And then the explanation, which is the key point, um, going into further detail about things and this will vary from one question to the next we'll look at throughout the course exactly what the individual um, needs are for each different question so what we're going to do today we're just going to look at a few small very small passages and um, as i say these aren't past papers but these are um, based on a style of writing which you will come across in the exam and on the sort of questions you will see in the reading part and particularly we're looking at how we can extract information out of these um, these sources so our first source here is just from an article by a man named John Smith who's talking um, about children and modern words. he says kids these days have become a PlayStation generation they don't spend enough time outdoors and spend far too long in front of a telly Parents might think they are keeping them safe by keeping them off the street, but in reality, they are setting them up for failure. And we've got a question below, which is, what is the behaviour of children like these days according to a source? So a question like this, which focuses on one element of the source, 
the behavior of children. It's much like really a question two in the exam. Question two will be over two sources, but it's always going to be focusing on one element. In a question like this, the author's not really um, relevant, um, and particularly not his methods, not his techniques, anything like that. We just want to look at what the behavior is and infer why this behavior might be. So we've got our answer below where it says, according to John Smith, children these days have become a PlayStation generation, spending far too much of our time indoors and in front of screens. Because we've got the underlying point of what John Smith has said. The children spend too much of our time in front of screens. We've got a quotation here, but notice it's just a couple of words quoted, PlayStation generation, and it's embedded in with our overall point. And we've explained really what is meant by PlayStation generation. He's not talking particularly about the PlayStation. He's not saying that um, children should spend longer playing Xbox rather than PlayStation. He's talking about screen time. People spend too much time indoors and in front of screens. I mean, after this, we've got a bit of info that says, however, we can infer from the source that this is not only caused by children always wanted to be in front of the telly. Um, they are, in fact, being forced into this couch potato lifestyle by overprotective parents who wish to keep them off the street. So we've got a um, couple of quotations, again, embedded in. Notice short quotations embedded in, but everything written in clear, correcting, because we've got in front of the telly, um, off the street. And we're saying, but parents, um, we can infer from the source, but... Um, Maybe children aren't always inside out of choice. Maybe it is as a result of our parents trying to keep them safe and it might be a negative side effect of this. So this is what we want to do when we look at the source to think what it means, and particularly when you're dealing with question two in the exam, think why it might be as well. Why do the children behave as they do? Now, of course, this is only a short example in the exam itself. You would want to continue expanding out, going to more detail. The source you would be dealing with would have a lot more detail and your answer would be expected to have more detail as well. But it really hopefully gives the idea here of how we want to be looking to use quotations, keeping them short and embedding them within our um, sentences. And it's so important as well um, to try and always write in clear, correct grammar, in flowing clear sentences. I would advise, particularly for people doing this course who are second language, don't overcomplicate your sentences, particularly in the reading part of the exam. Try to keep things to a couple of clauses, free maximum. So this happens because of this. As a result of this, this happens. And by keeping this simple, clear structure is what gets you to the passing grades, which is what nearly everyone doing this exam cares about. I know most people doing this exam they want it to go into teacher training or something similar, and they will generally need a grade four. Maybe with the odd university, they need a grade five, but that's what they're looking to do. So in this case, clarity is always the most important thing, writing in this clear, easy to follow um, types of sentences. Okay, we're going to move on to our second Example here, I'm just going to take a sip of water before we look at it. Okay, so our next example here, well, this is from a story. So it's actually from a fictional piece of writing. Obviously, the exam itself, the A-star exam is non-fiction writing. But the way you look at things, um, the skills you are looking for, everything like that, it doesn't actually vary just because the source is fictional or non-fictional. And in this case, we're focusing on language. So it's a lot more in the style of when you get to question three of the A-star exam, where you really want to focus in on the language. We're told it's from a story by um, Claire Parks. And we're told, George looked up at the large imposing tree towering over him. It was a giant staring back menacingly. And we're told, how does Claire Parks use language to describe a tree? So now, as well as before, we're focusing on an aspect of a source. Now, we are focusing on language. Well, when we are dealing with language, we are still, in effect, focusing on a similar sort of P-E-E -E structure. But our point 
is really what language is being used in this case. We want to include some technical language. We want to say what language is being used. We will need to provide evidence of it. It's really important when we provide evidence, but we only provide evidence of a technique we have mentioned. Now, a trap I see people fall into, they give two long quotations, and maybe within the quotation, it will include two or three different techniques, which means the examiner can't be sure, but the student knows what the technique they have mentioned is. Really important to quote only what you need and um, nothing more. And as we'll see here, when you're explaining, when you're dealing with language, another thing you can add as well, particularly when dealing with language, is zoom in. Zoom in is when you pull out a quotation, you analyze the quotation as a whole, talking maybe about the technique of a whole, so it's one, and then you zoom in on an individual word. You say the type of word it is, and you go into further detail about that. And again, zoom in is a really good, easy to learn structure which you can then um, apply to try and get yourself that additional depth. So we've got our answer here. Um, it says clad parts uses personification when she describes the tree as staring back menacingly. So um, personification is giving something non-human, human characteristics. We're going to, in lecture four of the series, we're going to focus a bit on um, language techniques and methods. Um, specifically, we're going to look at question three that week as well. But yeah, personification, giving something non-human human characteristics. In this case, it says the tree is staring back. Well, this is just the tree is um, in live in a way humans are alive. It's genuinely looking, trying to stare out um, the character. So it says, by describing the tree as looking out at George, Claire makes the reader understand the intimidation that he must have felt. So notice how we put the quote here when we're explaining it into our own words. If it's staring back, it's looking out. If it's being menacing, it's being intimidating, which means that George must have felt intimidation. If something is intimidating you, it's natural that you will feel intimidation. And then we are told, and this is zooming, as I mentioned, this is backed up by the adverb menacingly, um, a word which makes the reader understand that danger is present and gives the impression that the tree is out to harm George. So notice here, all we've done is we've really given a definition for menacingly. We said it's an adverb and we've given a definition, but you would never write menacingly means, you would write this helps the reader understand or this gives the impression that, or this implies to us that, and then use synonyms. It's just you need to write in that sort of more open um, artistic style and it just flows a lot better. It's going to pull you up the mark scheme writing like that. Okay, so sorry, I've just hit a zoom in like crazy button. But um, as you can see here as well, now, of course, in the exam, when you do a question three, you'll get a whole paragraph and you might be expected to write about three times what we've written here. But notice how, despite the fact there's lots of different things we could focus on, we've just focused on one element here and gone into detail about it. And this is something to realize in all questions in the reading part of the exam. Quality is more important than quantity. Now, of course, you need to write enough to hit all the parameters of a mark scheme and to make clear to the examiner that you know how to take on a question. But beyond that, it's more important to make fewer points in depth to really go into detail about things than trying to spot everything. If you just went through this and you said, like, large is an adjective, imposing is an adjective, towering can be seen as metaphorical, it was a giant, is a metaphor, staring back, is personification, menacingly, an adverb, or something like that, just listing off the different things without any detail, you would score very badly, even if you had a lot of technical language. Of course, you need to try and include technical language in, it's very important, but it's the analysis and it's the depth of the analysis which is really um, going to score you, going to score you the high marks. Okay. Um, so we'll move we'll move on from this then, and we're going to move on to our um, next example here. And so again, we're going to be looking 
a bit more in this style of question. It's a little bit, again, in the style of a question two, focusing on the feelings of bond lines. And you'll see with these different examples, it's getting a little bit bigger as we go along. We're adding a little bit more depth here just to show um, the understanding of what you need to take on. But of course, if anything's unclear, as I said, at any point at all, please don't hesitate to ask. But our next um, example here, um, we've got from an article by um, Bob Lyons. And Bob Lyons says, I read all the books and went to all the classes, but nothing could prepare me for that feeling the first time I had a baby in my hands. I felt a chill wash over me to know that right now my wife and I have responsibility for something so vulnerable, something so helpless. So obviously in this situation here, um, we're dealing from an article, Bob Lyons explaining his feelings when he became a father. And we've got quite a bit of information here. We know he's tried to prepare as much as possible. He's tried to read up on things, everything like that. But as he says, he still feels unprepared. He's overcome with nerves at the time. He says, I felt a chill wash over me. When we say that, it's like you come out in a sweat. It's like a physical manifestation of stress. And he said, like, but now he realised there's almost no, well, I mean, there is no going back. You can't take a baby back to the shop. Hey, I've got the responsibility now. I know you're going to have it going forward. Um, and so the question is, how did Bob Lyons feel when he first became a father. And we put, although Bob had tried to prepare for being a father, it didn't really, it didn't become real for him until the birth took place. So this time, and you can do this, we've just got a point on an individual sentence. In previous examples, we've had evidence embedded in on the first sentence, but you can just write a point and then jump into the evidence and the answer afterwards. And we said, he describes a chill wash over him, showing that the responsibility of being a father was causing him to panic. So this is quite probably lower level free. It's passable writing, it's clear, it's well written, but you could perhaps go into more detail, maybe talking about it being a physical manifestation of his stress, which is causing him to come out in a stress. I'm showing a bit more understanding of the words here, but he's overcome um, by by the chill as well. Um, but then our, set, our final sentence here is a little bit higher level. Where we've dropped from but previous sentences, as I say, you say more, it's passable, but not very high. The final sentence is more of level four, so the higher part of the mask. Because it says, in a way, knowing how unprovided he felt from fatherhood was causing him to feel as vulnerable and helpless as the babies in this arm. And the reason this would be up at the top levels of the mask scheme, this sentence, is because it would be deemed as being perceptive in a way it's flipped around the language bob has used about the child and put it back onto him and notice again with the quotations the quotations are um very small we've got one word invulnerable we've got helpless and we're saying um exactly but these words could just as equally apply to bob as they do um to to the baby in a situation now, a couple of important things to point out here is um, a very important thing. It might seem obvious, this, but you don't gain extra points for giving your personal opinion about Bob. Maybe you would read this article and you'd be like, why is he acting so self-involved at this moment? He should be spending more attention on his wife. Um, he's making it all about him or you could say something like well this really i can really empathize with bob this reminds me of when i became a parent um the feelings i had none of this all of this is great but it's not relevant to the question it's not going to gain you extra marks to so try to avoid that equally um i've seen it happen on questions in the past maybe it's um just one past exam for example where it's about a teacher and the teachers, a 19th century teacher, but definitely some of their attitudes would be um, seen as fairly antiquated. And I've had students turn so far against the teacher, but in effect, they've lost focus on the question. They're not really focusing on the exam. They're more angry at this. So try, even by occasionally, for example, question five, there's some opinion you do need to give, to try um, to stay 
um, sort of um, guarded from feeling too too emotional about the text to focus more on the language on the writing and everything like that than on really how you feel about the purpose of people within and any personal likes or dislikes okay so we're going to move on to our next example now um i will say by the way um hfac um this lecture is likely um to finish a little bit before the hour just because normally we'd have a few more people um in the class asking asking questions so there'll be a bit of time if you've got any general questions or anything at the end um how about have a think and that'll be a good time good time to ask them and if not we'll just probably end up ending a, a little bit earlier today but um our next example here we've got from a letter from jenny wise to her mother so you, you get different forms of sources within the exam um the most common of course is an article but you might get letters you might get speeches everything everything like that but and this can often it's a thing you can think about in the exam itself because particularly when you get to later questions and you're focusing on the author there's a big difference between a letter and an article and that's an article generally the writer is and well of course if you're writing an article you want people to read it you're trying to entertain a letter might be personal the person who wrote the letter may have had no intention for anyone to ever read the letter than the recipient of it it's unlikely but jenny wise was sitting there in 1872 thinking i'm going to be used in an english lecture in 150 years um time and so that's going to make an effect on how people write what their perspectives are what their intention is and all of this as you get into sort of question four question five of the exam can be useful things to think about now this letter here we're told it's from 1872 so it's a 19th century letter and jenny um we can see from it she's gone out she's she's from the city clearly possibly london and she's been sent out um to um the countryside it says out here in the country just to be clear in the country it's shorthand for um countryside so we can assume um given the nature of it also we get for this we can assume she's gone out from a uk city to uk countryside it doesn't mean she's gone she's gone abroad okay and so she's writing back to her mother and she says dear mother it feels like such a joy to finally put pen to paper to be able to tell you about my experience out here in the country. I don't miss the noise of the city, nor a smell. The only thing I miss are the cuddles you used to give me in the morning. Still, why the Brayfields are a cold family. They treat me well, and it's hard to describe the joys of a fresh morning air seeping into my system. And so the question, again, it's more in sort of nature, like question two, we ask, how does Jenny feel to be so far away from home and we can see within this there's some positives she expresses and some negatives there's definitely a lot of positives she definitely feels comfortable with the country as a place she's talking about um the smell of a city in a negative light and this is in stark contrast to a description of a fresh morning air in the countryside so she's definitely enjoying aspects of being in the countryside if there's anything she does miss it's um obviously her her mum she talks about um the warmth of her mum the cold of a family um she is with um and as it does a clear contrast that and so the answer here is pointed out it says jenny has mixed feelings about being so far away from her so this first sentence it sets up the answer it gives a template what's going to focus on and then we've used a classic template which is on the one hand on the other hand where where you're showing two sides um of the same coin so it says on the one hand she does feel a bit homesick and she misses the cuddles her mum used to give her in the morning something she's not likely to receive from the cold breath so notice we've taken quotes from two separate sentences and have joined them together we've managed to infer but what is meant by cold it doesn't mean they're physically freezing it means but they don't show affection so they're very unlikely to be a huggy family 
And he says, on the other hand, she states that she doesn't miss the city's noise, nor its smell. So we've got the focus here. Again, notice we've got the one word quotations um, embedded in the idea of a point being given with the evidence too. And then we said, the joyous feelings she describes when talking about the fresh air of the countryside suggests she doesn't miss the city as a place, even though she may miss the people in it. And yeah, that's clear. Contrast we've got here, she seems to genuinely love the feeling of being out in the countryside, the feeling of being out in nature. That's definitely a happiness which is portrayed um, within her words, but at the same time, there's an element of her missing her mum, of her um, feeling about the family she were with now, maybe lacks the warmth of what she is, what she is used to. Now, if you were going to expand up further on a question like this and really try and be perceptive, going to greater depth, you could speculate. You could say perhaps um, Jenny is um, is only happy to be out in a countryside, and she is um, talking about her mum's cuddles, potentially only to spare her mum's feelings, trying to make her mum feel better. Now, of course, this isn't something proven from the text, but when we're talking about inference. When we're talking about why something might be, you have an element of freedom about it. As long as something is plausible, as long as something is justifiable, you can argue it. So this would be one of those cases that where you can really expand out, you can really get out into depth of um, why Jenny potentially has written things as she, as she has and whether she truly does miss anything about the city at all. Now, again, you can see repeated down here. I know I said this already, but it's worth repeating. It's worth repeating again and again. The more depth and explanation you give, the more marks you will receive. And so every time you're making sort of a point in the exam, you want to make sure you expand it out. You want to provide that evidence and you want to provide that explanation. If need be, you want to provide method. If need be, you want to provide inference. Whatever the specific of what you need for that question at hand, you want to provide it, but you want to go into a lot of depth. And where you want to have a cohesive answer where everything links together, where it flows from one point to another, your individual points should also be like in depth. There should also be a lot to each individual point. Okay, and so we're going to move on to um, one more final example for now so this is from um school stories um which is a book by frederick kindle and so um frederick kindle says in that moment rage overcame the headmaster and as he shook violently his control had left him behind he was a vengeful monster overcome by a feeling of fury he only felt interested in causing the maximum damage to the cowering schoolboy below. He felt his hand clutch tighter on his cane and struck the disobedient child with a force faster than the wind. So, we are not given a date on this story. I think we can at least hope it's quite an old story. Um, it's definitely not something um, that Ofsted would be accepting in their um, rounds of schools. These, these days, it would be thoroughly illegal the behavior of a headmaster who definitely doesn't come across as a pleasant person within this and we're asked how does the writer use language to explain the personality of the headmaster so again we are focusing on language here and within this passage there's a lot of different areas you could focus on there's visceral violent language the rage the shaking violently the advert violently is visceral is really bringing to life is helping visualize the nostril we've got the metaphor of a um it must have been a vengeful monster they're losing the humanity out to go around but he's overcome by a feeling of fury you've got the alliteration here the repetition of the f in feeling of fury it's also again it's it's visual the idea but um and he's overcome by it, but the feelings defeated him. Um, 
And got his, his the cowering schoolboy below. So there's a big contrast in the adjective cowering, which makes the um, schoolboy sound tiny, minute, hiding under his hands, terrified. There's a huge contrast, and it really brings home the power of a headmaster, how absolutely terrifying it would have been for the student. We got again his hand clenched tighter on the coach. So again, it's very physical. The language here really helps us visualize the violence, the nasty nature of a headmaster, and struck the disobedient child with a force faster than the wind. Again, a bit of alliteration on what is a final metaphor. Again, a force faster than the wind. It's not literal, but it's how it would have felt like you can imagine, like the whoosh almost on a matapit sound of a violent hit from the teacher towards um, the child. So again, there's so many areas you could focus on on a question like this, but you won't be trying to focus on everything. You will be trying to pick out a few things, maybe linking them together and focusing on quality, really trying to get depth out of whichever part you focus on. So we're told in the story, Frederick Kindle paints the headmaster as a nasty man with a terrible temper. Okay, so again, we are starting with our point. We are outlining what we are going to talk about. And this can actually be a very good tactic on a question three. I would often say it's having a sentence which links all your ideas together, putting then an idea and making sure you use connectors between ideas so that your piece of writing flows as one cohesive work. These are all successful ways to add to clarity, to add yourself to that comfortable passing mark. It's definitely not wrong the first sentence if it certainly doesn't paint Frederick King the head, it certainly doesn't paint the headmaster as lovable. Which he uses the metaphor vengeful monster to make it clear that in times of rage that headmaster loses his humanity and with it any capacity for empathy. So again, small quotation. We've pointed out what technique is. It's a metaphor. He was a vengeful monster. Well, then we have just used synonyms. We've just explained what these words mean, but the way we have written makes it sound like analysis to make it clear that in times of rage, the headmaster loses his humanity. What is a monster if it's not something without humanity? If you've become a monster, you've lost any semblance of a human you were before. And so with it, any capacity for empathy. Well, empathy being the ability to feel the pain and then care for others. Well, of course, if he's turned into a monster, there is no capacity, no possibility that he is producing empathy in this situation. You really get the feeling throughout this passage, in fact, that he's um, just pure fury. He's literally just out to harm the kid. It's quite nasty, vindictive, cruel. Um, way of punishing. And in fact, we've got that here on this next sentence. So we're told the adjective vengeful shows that a headmaster is vindictive and motivated by a wish to cause suffering in those who make him feel bad. So again, notice we've zoomed in. We've zoomed in on the adjective vengeful, a cheap trick to expand out to make sure we've got a paragraph about this individual two words. And then we've explained um, what it means, which shows that it must be vindictive. What does vindictive mean? Vindictive means like you've got a nasty, cruel streak. You're out to make others suffer. Well, someone who's vengeful is likely to have that. And motivated by a wish to cause suffering and mode to make him feel bad. Well, exactly, vengeful. Vengeful just means you want to cause revenge. Um, if you wish to cause suffering and those who have made you feel bad, you are trying to get revenge. Again, just an explanation of what these words mean. And by doing that, by writing it in this sort of method, it counts as analysis, which is exactly what we need to do. A very successful way, but we can expand out and add more detail. Now, um, as it says here, like... The more information you give on what the word means, the better your mark can be. Um, and as you can see here, we've only focused on a couple of words here, but we've got five lines around it. And if you carried on after this, 
you could maybe have another sentence linking into his other. So you could say like the cruel, nasty nature of the headmaster is furtherly um is further exemplified um by um the um the physical nature of the phrase shook violently. This tells the reader that um rage has lo- um has caused the headmaster to lose control of his body and that's almost a nervous energy of anger. Furthermore the adverb violently adds to the impression that everything the headmaster is doing is vicious, that it is um nasty, that it is out to cause harm. So again you could add another phrase going into detail and putting it on top of this either in a new paragraph or in the same paragraph either way, but using a couple of phrases and making sure that they expand out on top on top of each other. Okay, so here we're just going to have a little run through some of the main things um, we have discussed today. And then if you've got any questions at all, either about today's lecture or about the course in general, um, please to ask them. Or even if you want to have a, a bit of a discussion at all, as it's just you here at HF. AC, if you want to have a bit of a, a general discussion about how you're getting on, I won't mind as well. I'll just I'll stop the recording after I finish this and we, we can do that as well. But um, in terms of um, just a general points to say in this, but although the questions in Section A are varied, this sort of similar template, the similar idea is going to work well on all of them. You just need to make the adaptations from one question to the next. So in question two, your explanation is going to involve inference. It's going to involve why are things taking place. You need to um, do that. On question three, for example, we're particularly focusing on method in the point, and you're going to zoom in. This is how you add further explanation, further, um, further depth as well. And then the more depth you give in your answers, the better. And so quality of answer is always more important than quantity, and especially quality of points made is more important than quantity of points made. So it's fair to make three points and expand out, give depth about them, than to make ten rough points, and because you haven't given depth, it almost reads like brainstorming. Much better to make fewer points, but points with greater depth of analysis. Now to say as well, you only need to um, quote what is relevant to a question. You should not be quoting whole sentences, only um, the words that serve you. So really important, and hopefully that's been clear for all the examples today. The quotations we use are short. It always says in a mark scheme, at the top level of the mark scheme, it says you need to be judicious in your quotations. Now, judicious, it means to show good judgment. To quote something which is relevant to the question, that is relevant to your point, but to only quote what you need and nothing more. And I said this is particularly important when you're talking about types of words and methods. If you say the adjective and you quote four words and only one of them is an adjective, then the examiner has got no way of knowing if you know what an adjective is or not. Even if you do know the examiner, doesn't know that you know. So only quote what you need and nothing more. If you're talking about a metaphor, you quote a metaphor, but then also um, add another technique afterwards. Again, the examiner might not be sure you know what a metaphor is. So only quote what you need and nothing more. Really, really important. And finally, really important to say, again, something hopefully that's come across in this thing, is you want to stick with Correct English and grammar at all times. Quotations are not separate. They should be embedded within sentences. And the sentence as a whole needs to make sense. I should also say as well, but your sentences should make sense regardless of whether you've got the source in front of you or not. So don't shorthand, make sure that your point would make sense to someone. They, even if they're not looking at the source at exactly the same time, but your sentences um make complete sense really really important that um having that clarity having that quality of language 
I should say that as well, the more um, varied and sophisticated your vocabulary, the better you're going to score as well. Now, I know a lot of people who are doing this course are second language, and so it can be very challenging to have very sophisticated vocabulary, if that's the case, but just do your best with the vocabulary you have, but do be try to be conscious of that, of trying to use more sophisticated language when you have got it to hand, to not miss a trick in that way, either in terms of techniques or in terms of language. All right, so that takes us to um, the end of the main um, presentation. Do you have any any questions at all? Uh, yes, but not to do with uh, today's lesson. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so what, what is the question? Um, it's to do with um, advice on analyzing different texts. Okay. I, okay, so in, in in what context? Just in in general of how to how to analyze text. Sort of, can you can you be a little bit more more specific yeah. if possible? Um, how do I improve my ability to be able to, for example, look at the language techniques and then analyze them? Is there like any um, revision guides or something that I can read to practice? So what I would really say in terms of language techniques, um, I wouldn't say, just to ask, just before I answer this, how, how are you on sort of types of words and language techniques? So do you know any sort of language techniques, things like similes, metaphors, and how do you feel about knowing when words, as for example, adjectives, adverbs, things, things like that? Uh, I studied it at school, but I forgot. Yeah, okay, I completely understand. And he said, now, what I would say to you is um, don't try and learn every single technique or every single type of word. Try to learn a few things um, well. So try um, to um, focus, for example, on types of words, to be really, really confident, to be able to recognise adjectives, adverbs and verbs because these are the main things you can expand out about and so you'll find um in the documents um for for the course there's a document for um it's for lecture number four so it'll be the lecture we come to in two weeks here where we'll go through things but where we talk a bit about language techniques and there's a document with that with it's got some types of words in and some techniques as well. I would also say in terms of techniques, try to make yourself really confident on similes, on um, metaphors, maybe a couple of other things, trying to be confident on areas like exaggeration or um, or, or hyperbole um, or um, things like that. Um, but don't, don't worry about trying to learn absolutely every technique. It's better to learn a few things well, because where you really pick up your marks is in the quality of your analysis. Now, I would say in terms of resources, obviously there's some resources from A Star will have sent you in terms of types of words with these lectures as a lecture for, I would say um, a couple of good um, YouTube channels out there. There's one called Everything English, I believe is, um, or Mr. Everything English, I forget his name. And another one called Mr. Braff. And these are ones I know some of my students have used, have found useful. People doing GCSE have found useful as well. I would also advise you any resource from GCSE English language can be useful for um, A Star as well because, um, because that's crossover. The A Star exam is basically an amalgamation of the two English language GCSE. So, any resources from that can be useful. Everything English and Mr. Bruff are both resources actually for GCSE, but they can be um, useful too. Now, my other main tip I would give you when analyzing text and when picking quotations, always pick quotations, but you are confident you understand. Don't try and pick the most sophisticated quotes possible or anything like that. Pick quotes where you clearly understand the language 
so that you can explain what the language means. It's better to pick a simpler quote and to have more depth of analysis than to pick a more complicated quote when you're not really sure what technique it is and what, what the words mean. So try to pick things that you are confident about. And if you really don't feel confident at this stage with any of that, I would just advise trying to get in as much um, in the short term, trying to read quite a bit as well, trying to read um, potentially um, some opinion pieces, newspaper articles, things like that. They love in the exam, in the A-star exam. Source A often seems to be a Guardian article, an Observer article. So reading some of those articles from areas like culture, things like that, it can help you get used to the type of language that will come up come up as well. And my next question is um, signposting words. For example, um, do you know, for example, when you say uh, we can infer from the source, or for example, um, this helps the reader to understand, or this implies, or this suggests. Um, do you have anywhere where I can find more of those, or no? Um, so, in terms of um, those those words, what what you could do, for an example, if you look up words like connectors, connectors are often going to give you quite a lot of words to link things. Um, discourse markers as well. Equally, if you use the phrases you know, and if you search for a thesaurus, you're going to find additional ones for that as well. And it's, yeah, exactly. Again, you don't need to have every phrase under the sun, but you're right in thinking if you've got four or five different ones you can use in that, it's great to have these sentence starters and these structures that you can fall um, back on and, and use. So, yeah, as you say, we, we can infer from this, we can understand from this, this leads us to believe, this tells us this, this influences the reader to think. So all of these little phrases, just trying to get like a few of them together. And it, it's often a case of just looking at the sources. You'll probably know a lot more of them than you think you do. So it's just familiarising yourself, reading back. Again, looking at... Um, Sample answers can be a good way as well. So in the A star pack, you're going to see sample answers in that, and they will have um, lots of phrases like this. Equally, if you look up past GCSE English language and look up the examiner's packs, the, the indicative standard responses of this, you're going to see a few of these different phrases. And it will just be a case of, um, of practice, to be honest, of trying to make yourself use different ones as you practice of whenever you hear one either in these classes or you see one in a text noting it down keeping it and then making sure next time you practice some questions of putting it in i would i would say probably now i'm guessing obviously i haven't i haven't seen you work so i, I could be wrong but from from the questions and where you're at it is probably you haven't done something like this for a while so it's a case of building up confidence so i'd really when you were first practicing really focus on these different phrases trying to learn don't worry so much about the timing of the exam or anything like that at this stage and then when you're confident in the template for different questions that's when i would start worrying about getting quicker and trying to think about real exam conditions and things things like that okay thank you yeah no problem at all um well i'm gonna leave it then now for um tonight so thank thank you so much for making it a long i'm hoping um it doesn't mean if it didn't come through to you but there's um been too much technical problems as i say um with it it should normally i'm not sure if it comes through on the a star site itself or with an email but there should normally be a link that pops through and it will come through anytime from about three four hours to an hour before before class so if ever it gets to sort of 30 minutes before when you haven't seen anything feel free to feel free to drop me a message normally i wouldn't have picked up the email to be honest it's only because no one was here but i hadn't started yet so if you, nothing's come through try to message a little bit earlier and then i'll keep up an eye for it as well so is it 8 30 it starts yeah exactly it starts at 8 30. in fact what i would say drop me um if you if you just put your email address in the chat 
because we do still yeah. manually send out a few of uh, um, the links. I'll add you to the spreadsheet of manually sent out links, and then that way you can make sure. So if you just write your email address in in it, and also also um, your name, or it's no problem if you want to go by HFHC, it's not a problem. Either. I just got my name. I have four names. That's why. Okay. Yeah. No. No. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right. So is that all right if you just copy it? Yep. So that's from my. So, so sorry. How how do you pronounce this word? I didn't quite catch. Um, Hamara. Hamara. Okay. Okay. And can you just probably? Yeah. My email. Email address. All right. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for making it along this evening. It would have been a very very lonely class if not. So I do appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a great week. And yeah, so the classes will be eight thirty every every Thursday. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, you too. Bye bye.